When I first started running the business, I always sort of felt I was on my own a bit. So sort of no one really did it like the way I did it. So it's really nice to be in a room um, amongst fellow people who I think get it and run your organisations and think like we do. So maybe at the end of my talk you'll agree or, or, or disagree, but I feel very much I'm amongst friends here. So um, what I'm going to do is just talk about how I run the business and specifically how we do the people bit. And our business, I like to think, is quite unusual. We serve 400,000 customers a week. I, I work with 3,500 wonderful colleagues. And our business is so dependent on people that if we have a superstar working in a shop one week and replace them with someone who is, is probably one of our um, least able colleagues, our turnover will drop 50 to 70%. So our whole business is focused on how we find wonderful people. But it all started very, very differently. Um, long before any of us were around, 1865, my great-great-grandfather um, was sent from his little farming village near Northampton to go to Manchester, where some of his family had just gone to go and get a job, because in those days, the, the only jobs you could find were in, the, were in the industrial cities, especially in the north. And he was put on the train in Kettering, and because he'd never been on a train, he, 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 when he got to Birmingham, he got on the wrong connection and ended up in Sheffield. Spent the night sleeping on the platform in Sheffield, and a very nice man in the morning, saw he was sort of, you know, had no idea what he was doing, this young 14 year old lad, and gave him some money to get to Manchester. So there he started selling shoelaces on a, on a bicycle in Salford. Made, you know, obviously sold quite a few shoelaces, opened up a shoe shop, and then um, the whole sort of thing started to happen. In 1903, he opened up a shoe repair shop. And ever since he started running the business, there's always been an ethos of looking after people who otherwise uh, wouldn't necessarily get the help. So, um, and fortunately, we managed to remain a family business, although cer certain times we weren't. But I feel very strongly that we have benefited from that ethos of uh, helping people on their uppers and such. So, just to give you a bit of background, um, probably lots of you have been in one of our, I think, what, 900, in fact, we never actually know how many shops we have. We keep adding it up and always come up with a different number. But we've got about just under 1,000 uh, Timpson shops. And we also have uh, 450 Max Film and Photo Shops, and we also own a business called Snappy Snaps as well, which is our only franchise business. But the key to our business, as I said earlier on, is employing wonderful people who have the skills they need to do the job, and we let them get on with it. But like all of organizations, there's a complex array, array of plates spinning behind the scenes to make that work. So how do we do it? The key is our culture. We run the business upside down, which means that those <coughs> colleagues who serve customers are the most important people in our business. They are the kings and queens. They can do whatever they think is right to serve customers in the best way possible. And it always amazes me with business that we, we, we spend ages taking people on. We look for the real superstars, the, you know, the highly qualified people, and then we put them in the job with hundreds of rules and, and systems and processes um, and we don't actually let them do what we want them to do. We're employing adults, people who um, have children, have cars, have mortgages, um, take out insurance policies. I was saying to Richard earlier on, but we don't trust them to decide how much stock they're going to order or how they're going to serve a customer. So we decided to completely change the way we ran the business. In the old, when I first started in the business, it was run very much on military grounds because it was run by an ex-colonel. Um, so as long as you basically followed orders and take the box, you would get a job. It doesn't matter if you know, the, the turnover wasn't very good or customers weren't happy. As long as you ticked the boxes, you were doing fine. So to change a culture took me, at le I would say, at least five years. And to do that, uh, it was just concentrating on the colleagues in the shops because middle management is where the problem is. Because they like to in in invent rules and systems and processes to control things. And the reason, in my view, the reason why they do that is because things go wrong, and things go wrong because, from my experience, the people aren't right. So you, you put all these rules and processes in place because you've got the wrong people. So if you work in one of our shops, you can order whatever stock you want. You can have displays however you wish. You can paint the shop pink. If any of you live near Faversham, we actually have a pink shop. The Max Spielman shop there is pink because um, the, the, the team who run the shop, for some reason, really like pink, so they painted the shop pink. Fortunately, the turnover went up a bit, so maybe I should paint all the other shots pink, but I didn't. And, and, um, but one of the keys for us is the colleagues in our shops can also decide what price they're going to charge. They can't go above our price guide, 
but they can do deals and do discounts. If we stop that, we'd drop 25% in turnover straight away. So, the next time you go in any of our shops, this is how you're gonna save, it's gonna cost me a lot of money, this I shouldn't really be telling you. <laughs> you go in for two keys to be cut, and they say, right, that's um, seven pounds, please. And you go, sorry, I've only got a fiver. I guarantee they'll take the fiver every time. So, and if any of you want a 15% discount card, email me at the end and I'll send you one as well. So then, you, so, so then, but you only pull that out right at the end. So in our business, we talk about culture all the time. And you know, our business is, you know, is we, we make a lot of money, everything's sort of, you know, it's been successful and we've grown. Not because we've got the best looking shops, not because we've got the best key blanks, but it's because our culture is really, really strong. And we talk about it a lot and we cherish it a lot. But there are two keys for us that we need to get right for the culture to work. The first is we've got to look after our wonderful people. So a lot of this is connected with what um, best companies do as well. You can only make a culture work if you look after your people. I do not know any business that's been successful long term that doesn't look after their people. So we do lots of things I'm probably sure a lot of, a lot of other people do. In fact, most of these things I've copied off people like you. So, Birthdays off. Every colleague gets their birthday off as an extra day off. I copied that off my friend, um, our, our friend Richard, who used to run Millie's Cookies. It's the best benefit anybody will ever get. They love it. So when, when someone's um, being interviewed for a job with us, and we don't pay mega bucks at all, um, so they're, they're going for a job interview with us or Greg's, and we say, well, you get your birthday off as well, they're far more likely to come to us. Um, we have holiday homes where colleagues can go for free on holiday. Um, we, we do dreams come true, we have a colleague loan schemes, we do all these sort of things. Everyone gets a birthday present um, and we do lots of sort of social events. Um, but you've got to look after your people to make this work. And the next thing is, you've got to recruit the right people. So, how do we do it? Well, we don't bother, it's quite interesting hearing what you're saying about CVs. And stuff. We don't bother with CVs, the only point of a CV for us is your name and your phone number. The rest we don't even read. We're not bothered about psychometric testing. We don't put you in rooms with one-way mirrors and see how you interact with other people. All we're interested in is what is your personality? Because we know if we get the right personality, it will fit into our culture and they will really thrive in our culture. So what we do is we sit down and we have a 10-minute chat. And all I'm trying to work out is what's your personality. So I want people who are helpful, happy, kind, punctual, um, just a bit buzzy, honest, smart. They, they, just, they just got it. And you can't work that out from a CV. So after we've had a cup of tea and you've walked out of the room, I'll tick the box. And if, and if you're some of those, that's good news. But if you're some of these, this is not good news. So we don't want Mr. Scruffy, uh, Mr. It's Five O'Clock, uh, Mr. Dull, uh, Mrs. Slow, um, Miss Fib, Mr. K we don't want those. No one wants those sort of people. So we work that out by just talking to people, looking them in the eye, and then we make a decision straight away who we want to recruit. So, we really look after our colleagues, but we only recruit on personality. And one of the other keys to our recruitment is we always have to have a waiting list. If you don't have a waiting list, you panic recruit and you always end up recruiting people who aren't good enough. And in our, in our business, we only want to recruit people who are nine or a 10 out of 10. Eights aren't good enough for us. And if you are eight or less, I'm afraid you have to find your happiness elsewhere. Being a, a, a leader of a company that values its culture very strongly, I, I feel it's very, very important in my role to ensure that those colleagues who aren't good enough are out of the business as quickly as possible. And to do that, you need the confidence of a waiting list of wonderful people wanting to work for you. So all our area managers all the time have to have a waiting list of people already interviewed. We love them. They're nines and tens and we just can't wait for that vacancy to, to put them in. It's interesting what you were saying earlier on, Jonathan. We are struggling on recruitment. The further towards London you go, we're finding it harder. Um, and certainly in London, we probably ha hardly have anybody on our waiting list at the moment, which for us is a real problem. So our culture is really important. We look after our colleagues who have wonderful personality, but we've got to have this waiting list. And this is probably the only part of the culture that's not upside down. I force the area teams to have the waiting list. So where, does it, where do prisons come into this? When I was, I must have been about six or seven, my parents started fostering children. And since then, they've adopted, I've got two adopted brothers as well. And I remember going to Style Prison with the babies, of these babies we fostered, to go and see the mums. 
and we used to drop them off. Sometimes you know, we could, we'd be allowed into the mother and baby unit and stuff. I always remember it sort of, I mean, at, at the time it sort of felt a bit normal, but it probably wasn't really. But these young people go into a prison with these with other mums. So I, I've always been quite interested in it. And about 13, 14 years ago, I was invited to go around a local prison in Warrington just to go and have a look around. So I thought, I've been before, got some, some sort of connection with it, be interesting. And then I always remembered that when I used to run our shops in London, this was just after I left university, um, we had two or three colleagues who were brilliant, apart from when they were drinking, and then they used to go and get banged up. And I used to go, I mean, I, I think I've been to about four or five police stations and also Reading Prison to go and collect my cobbler colleagues to bring them back to work because they're great at serving customers and putting money in the till. So I sort of got an affinity towards it. And I walked around and it became pretty clear to me that there were some superstars here, people who had the right personality for me. And they were finding it very, very difficult to get work. And I came across this guy, Matt. 19 years old he was then, um, never been in trouble with the police before. If any of you live near Warrington and been to Mr. Smith's nightclub, you will know, yeah, Mr. Smith's nightclub in Warrington. Um, a guy had a, um, pinched his girlfriend's bum. He hit this guy. He got three years. Whole life ruined. He had a, an apprenticeship all lined up. Everything was a disaster. So I really liked his personality. I said, listen, when you're out, here's my business card. Give me a ring. When he was out, his mum phoned me, not Matt. And um, we started him in, in, a, ironically in our shop in Warrington, just around the corner from the prison. And he's still there. It was absolutely fantastic. So I thought, right, I'm going to get some more mats. He's good. He takes money. He gets it. Um, and colleagues like working with him. So then, I didn't tell anybody in the business at the time I, I was doing this. So I went into a few more prisons, and I managed to find some fantastic people. I also managed to make some huge mistakes. I took on um, people who I ended up paying off their drug dealers, um, <laughs> some weird and wonderful people. I ended, also, my mother-in-law ended up looking after um, a colleague's dog for three months. Um, and then he ended up nicking all my money from Brent Cross, our uh, shop in Brent Cross, and we never saw him again. So we ended up with a dog. Um, <laughs> but over time, I said, right, I'm going to get to 20. I'm going to employ 20. Um, we don't call them ex-offenders in our business. We call them foundation colleagues. And then I'm going to tell everybody in the business. So I learned how to do it. I didn't go for young offenders. I found them really, really, really It was too challenging for us. I went for people who'd probably been in prison two or three times, had... Um, a, some sort of solid relationship, whether it was um, parents, girlfriend, boyfriend, often had kids and just wanted to do normal. They were fed up with the chaos that they were living in and they just wanted a normal job. And that's why I offered a normal job. So um, I got to 20 and I got all my area managers and all my area teams together and I told them what I've been doing. And I was expecting sort of, you know, oh no, this is another mad James scheme. But the reaction was very, very different, which was, that's fantastic. Lots of people came up to me quietly over the next few days. I'm pleased you told me that because when I was younger, you know, I, th I had one, one of my senior colleagues threw a, um, a supermarket trolley in the canal and got a criminal conviction for it. And it's, it, it, it's very much baggage that, that people carry around for the rest of their lives. Even if that conviction is spent, they always worry that they're going to get found out. They're going to worry that it's going to affect their employment. So I said, let's go for it. So we started going in loads and loads of prisons, and then the press got hold of it. The worst headline we had was, Killer Cobbler Cuts Keys. Now, for, it, for any of you in the communication business, that's pretty bad, isn't it? It doesn't get any worse than that. So then, then I worked out the way to get over this problem was just to tell everybody what we did. And you know, we're, we're sort of pretty, I like to think sort of, we keep ourselves to ourselves. Um, but we decided to tell everybody. And ever since then, I've never, ever had a bad piece of press about us, about the work that we do. In, in employing ex-offenders. And for lots of companies, that is a real concern about what are our customers going to think, what are our colleagues going to think. And my suggestion to you is just be open and honest about it, and it's actually a real strength. So after we recruited Matt, I decided that I might as well really go for it. So we opened up a training academy in Liverpool prison. So I said, right, we're going to teach everyone to repair shoes, repair watches, engrave. We opened it up as a shop. Um, everyone wore Timpson uniform, the, the tie and the badge and so on. The one thing we weren't allowed to do was to cut keys. <laughs> because this was in a Category B <laughs> prison. But the one, thing we, the one thing we learned from this is the best way to recruit people from prison is actually interview them when they're still in. For every day that, they have out, that they've left prison before they go into a job is a real problem. So if, you, if someone um, leaves prison today, they start working for us tomorrow. And a lot of the time, we will go and put a rent deposit down on a flat, 
I mean, people leave prison with 47 quid and a plastic bag with their possessions in. Um, so, you know, we buy things like, you know, toothbrush, deodorant, you know, things that you, we all expect to have. But we need to make sure that they don't have the excuses that this is going to be another failure in their life. We want it to work. So we opened one in Liverpool. And then we opened one in Blantyre House down in Kent, where we could cut keys, because this was an open prison. So and in this one as well, we had men and women um, learning all, all of our skills. And then uh, more recently, we opened one in Newhall Prison, which is a women's prison in, in just outside Wakefield. Um, and we're opening another, um, this is our Max Spielman business, we're opening another one in Bronzefield Prison just near Heathrow um, in, a, in, in a few weeks' time. And the great opportunity for us is we can train them on the skills so they have the confidence. And what also happens is they go out on day release to work in our shops. So here is a random statistic for you. Today, we have nine shops being run, by, being managed by colleagues who spent last night in prison. So they woke up this morning, normally had a packed breakfast, because the breakfast isn't ready in time. They either got in their own car or bus or a taxi, got to work, with, you know, we give them all the keys and everything. So they, they open the door, they run the shop all day, they order stock, they serve customers, they do the banking, and then they lock the door at night and go back to prison. So that when they're released, it's just already part of what they do. They got the confidence, they got the skills, and we really like them. And they're earning good money. You know, the, uh, they're earning really good commission. And interestingly, after um, the, my, my presentation today, I'm going to meet one of my area managers, one of my Max Spielman area managers in North London, who we recruited from Newhall Prison. So she, she was, um, she, I think she did 18 months for fraud. Um, she joined us here, she thrived in the training academy, and um, we, we took her on. She's quickly risen to the ranks, so she's now um, looking after 80 colleagues and probably a six, seven million pound business. And so it goes to show we're not just looking at colleagues to work on the shop floor or to work um, in your catering teams or in your, cl in your cleaning teams. You know, we are looking for people who are potentially able to run parts of your business. Um, you'd be amazed how many wonderful people there are in prison. You've got to work hard at it to find those people, but when you get them, they are far more loyal. They're far, more, they're far less likely to leave you. They're far less likely to do anything wrong. They're far less likely to steal from you, ironically. Um, we have four ladies in our finance department, all convicted for fraud. <laughs> if you speak to Helen, who runs our finance department, she says they are some of the four best colleagues we have. So it's not just ex-offenders we recruit. We also spend a lot of time now on recruiting ex-military. Often, a lot of um, prisons are, a large number of people in prisons have actually been in the forces as well. So we've actually done the double. Colchester Military Correction Centre um, is a place where um, it's about 300 men in there. We have some of the best recruits we've ever recruited come from a military prison. So we sort of get both. Um, so I, I would say uh, some of the military um, colleagues we've recruited make some good number twos. So we want quite entrepreneurial people. Some of the ones we've taken on aren't the most entrepreneurial, but we found it as a good way of recruiting people. Probably less good. We aren't as good at doing ex-military yet as we are at doing ex-offenders, and maybe that's just a learning curve. I don't know. But in our office, we, 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 we take on um, um, long-term unemployed, um, especially in our, in our warehouse. That's been a real success. And we took on our first Down Syndrome colleague two weeks ago to work in our reception. So... We don't just want to be known as the people who take on people from prison. We take on anybody who's got the right personality, and then we'll give them the skills to do the job. But it wouldn't work by just me doing it on my own, going around all the prisons doing the recruiting. Although, ironically, I was doing some MOJ work at um, um, Hatfield Prison on Monday, which is near Doncaster, and two of the guys I was talking to who were doing some CV uh, online um, practice, I recruited both of them when they were there, so I managed to slip my business card, and I kept going. But for, for any of you who um, are involved in, in, in recruitment and want to go into this area in a, in a big way, you need a Darren, or, or his predecessor was Dennis, so someone who is permanently doing this. I've come across too many examples where leaders in organisations say, yeah, James, that's a, we must be doing this, this is great. I arrange them to go around a prison, I often take them around myself, show them some fantastic superstars, show them how it works, and then they end up delegating it to their HR team who delegate it to someone else, and it never happens. You need someone who is on it, who is passionate about it, and you can't get anybody better than Darren. Ex-copper, ex-offender. 
Yes, they are linked. <laughs> Even when he was still in prison, he recruited another four for me. Um, but he's going around prisons, interviewing, selecting, sorting out all, all the various issues around it. So you need someone who's on it all, all the time to make it work. Um, I'm also involved in the Employers Forum for Reducing Reoffending, and there, I know there are similar, similar um, sort of government-supported um, organisations that concentrate on um, re recruiting disabled people, long-term unemployed people, and so on. But if any of you are interested in, in recruiting anybody from prison, then this is a great way of, uh, of getting stuck in. We've got people like Greggs, Marks and Spencers, um, huge amounts of organisations. The recycling industry is very, very strong um, in recruiting ex-offenders as well. So, but if you really want to know how to do it, please email me, james.timpson.com. I will take you around prisons. We will actually recruit people from prison for you. For me, the best way to get you on board and to, to, to help you do this is I will actually sacrifice some of my wonderful colleagues from, who I've identified in prison and give them to you. Because I'm so confident that they will make a really good go of it and be a successful colleague for you. And, because you don't need one, you don't need two, from my experience, you need five to ten to really make it work and to become something that is a permanent fixture in your organisation. So if I could wave a magic wand, I would get all HR directors into a prison at least once, twice a year. And I would, and I, I think I mentioned this to Pretty before, I would, I would introduce a, some sort of new law, or, or ha however it works, that any business that employs over 250 colleagues needs to recruit one or two percent from disadvantaged backgrounds, whether it's ex-offender, ex-military, long-term unemployed, disabled, or care leavers. I think we all have a responsibility to help those people get jobs, but actually what we're doing is helping our business, because I can put my hand on my heart and tell you that the reason why our business is successful is we have recruited great people, and a lot of those great people have come from places that no one else go, no, no one else will go to to find them. So I'm actually at the moment, I think I'm in a, ha having a, a bit of an easy ride because I'm going to prisons because not many other people there and I'm picking all the best. I want to go to a stage where it actually happened to me about three weeks ago, Greg's had gone into Drake Hall Prison and nicked all the good people before we got there. <laughs> and I want that to be all around the country um, because um, these wonderful people deserve an opportunity but also your company benefits an awful lot through employing these wonderful people. So, I hope that's given you a feeling of how our mad Timpson world works, um, how culture is so important to the way we do things, and how we just look for people who have personality. And if any of you go into any of our shops and want to have a haggle, you should be able to get a third off. <laughs> so set yourself a target of a third off. If you don't get that, you're not going hard enough. Jonathan, thank you very much. Thank you.